G'day guys, it's Rodney from I Comply here and we're here for another segment of Having Now on the Farm where we talk about pretty much anything and everything to do with horticulture and today I've got a, a pretty special guest because we're going to have a chat about the industry which he works in and uh, when I connected with Angus, uh, one of the things that impressed me the most was he's a man that specialises in a very specialised field and has travelled the world uh, to get as much knowledge as he can before bringing that to Australia. And I'm talking about uh, cannabis, of all things. Now, uh, Angus, thanks for agreeing to have a yarn with us. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, it's good to be with you. Mate, I, um, I see that you're an Australian cannabis professional. Now, um, I come from an area in uh, Queensland, an area called Caboolture, where I walk down the street and I see Australian cannabis professionals every day of the week. Probably not the same cannabis professional that you are per se. Um, mate, you've, you've travelled around the world, you've spent some time in Canada. Um, mate, how did you get into the industry of cannabis and it was, was it something of a passion project or something that you just sort of fell into? Certainly. So, yeah, I mean, I've been working in, uh, in medicinal cannabis for maybe four or five years now. Um, I started off as a horticulturist. I started off in amenity horticulture and did my apprenticeship probably maybe 10 or 12 years ago. So I started off, uh, yeah, just working in parks and gardens and then really had a passion for glasshouse and protected cropping sort of horticulture. Um, and I realized that there were a number of new sort of movements in, in that space with medicinal cannabis in Canada. So I decided to, yeah, make some inroads into that industry in Canada. And yeah, here I am now in Australia doing the same thing. So yeah, just, just, to, kind of, just to kind of straighten out, you know, what a, a medicinal cannabis professional is, is, you know, there's a lot of people from different backgrounds, horticulture being one, pharmaceuticals being another, engineering um, and, you know, a variety of people who are kind of drawn to the industry to, to help people. So, yeah. We, um, you know, medical or harvesting or farming of, of cannabis for medicinal purposes in Australia is uh, relatively new per se. Um, how far are we behind the rest of the world when we come to uh, harvesting of marijuana for medicinal purposes. Are we sort of on par or uh, are the parts of the country sort of a bit further ahead? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a, a number of regulatory frameworks internationally and, you know, for me, I'm not really a fantastic uh, regulatory person on these matters. I really focus on, on cultivation. In terms of cultivation, you know, there's probably... Um, no distinction between what we do in Australia from anywhere else in the world. Uh, for you know, for that matter, we sort of being in Australia, we're blessed with um, some fantastic natural elements, great sun, great weather um, for protected cropping. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of um, like a loose regulatory framework. Um, you know, Canada and the United States have had, in, in certain jurisdictions, have had uh, medical frameworks and certain um, medical arrangements in states in the US for a number of years. Australia has had it probably maybe five plus years now. So yeah, we've been going strong for a long time and we're really sort of coming into our own as an industry in Australia. I think there's a, um, you know, you talk cannabis, you know, there's a misconception that, you know, what people use cannabis for, they, they use it to get high, but that's simply not the case. There's, there's so many medicinal purposes um, and so many things that cannabis are actually getting used um, to, towards to treat now. Um, have you seen a real growth in that space with regards to, I guess, the uses of, uh, of marijuana or cannabis for uh, medicinal purposes? Yeah, I have to be honest, as a, a cultivator, I, I don't really know a lot about that area. I'm definitely not a, a physician and I definitely don't do any work with product manufacturing or prescribing. 
Um, what I will say though is it's not really my my space to judge why people are, are using cannabis for you know medicinal reasons, and um, I sort of maintain that if if people are getting some benefit out of it, that's sort of where where my uh, my knowledge stops on the matter. I guess you don't have to like tomatoes to grow tomatoes, you know, but you're you're more interested in the growing aspect, which is something that you're very passionate about. Um, with regards to, to the growing of, of such a product, um, you talk protective cropping. Is that how most of it's grown at the moment? Is it all grown in a protective cropping environment? What sort of temperature does it need? Uh, is it hydroponic? Is it in the soil? Um, you know, the only sort of cannabis idea I get is uh, what I see on the news, which is completely different to how you guys grow up commercially. Yeah, so there's, I mean, for each company out there, there's a variety of different um, cultivation techniques. I would say that there's, I mean, ranging from field grown hemp right through to tightly controlled environment chambers. Um, broadly speaking, there's, I mean, a number of ways, you know, broadly speaking, cannabis plant, uh, the drug type cannabis plant is a photo period sensitive plant. So, you know, you need 12 hours of dark, 12 hours of light to trigger flowering. Um, but yeah, you'll find that people are, um, you know, at least from my experience in Canada, you have outdoor summer cropping and you have indoor tightly controlled um, craft producers um, producing medicinal cannabis. So yeah, a really wide variety of um, styles that people approach it with. Tell, tell me about your career, because you, know, you, as we touched on before, you um, you went over to Canada and you, you obviously worked in, in this field, in the cannabis field over in Canada. How did that come about? I mean, you see a lot of young, you know, guys in agriculture that want to travel overseas because you know, there's a lot more cutting cutting edge technology. You know, there's a lot of people over in Holland, which are you know very good in agronomy and what have you. Um, I'm really intrigued as a as a young Aussie bloke that you know saw a field which he was interested in. Um, how did you go about making those steps to get over to Canada and to uh, to get some more experience? Yeah, so I mean, post post apprenticeship, I was you know working in various sort of forms of horticulture, and um, what actually started my curiosity in the more science based style of cultivation, or at least you know environmental controlled environment style of cultivation, was going to uh, Burnley uh, University of Melbourne's Burnley campus, which is sort of famous. Uh, horticulture campus, still very amenity based, but it's 150 years of continuous horticulture education and sort of deal you into a lot of these, you know, like deep biology concepts and the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum and like all sorts of um, amazing um, scientific sort of education there, as well as, you know, design and amenity horticulture. And I just knew there was, there was more beyond um, banging plants in the ground and giving them water, if that makes sense wrong. There was, there was sort of a, a, a technology revolution going on in, you know, like social media. It seemed like everyone was making an app around that time. And I thought, well, what's the highest form of uh, technology in agriculture? Like, what are we doing? Like, what can we achieve? And of course, you look at some of the stuff NASA did to try and grow plants in space and you work back from there. And, you know, even some of the companies in the States um, in terms of horticultural lighting now are, are born from those like sort of NASA style experiments earlier. And so yeah, I really got interested in controlling um, controlling uh, plant growth environments. And, and that sort of led me to cannabis because obviously a lot of investment was going into the, the sector at that time in Canada. And yeah, I decided to move over there and so uh, a couple of years, so it was a, kind of- Did you find a company and then just say, well, pick up the phone and say, g'day, I'm from Australia. Like, how did you make that move over to there? That's what I'm really curious about because there's a lot of young blokes out there that are probably thinking right. the same right. thing and they, they just don't know what to do. Sure. Yeah, no, I definitely did my research and, and made sure I knew where I wanted to move. Um, I decided to move to the West Coast. It seemed like they had a, a better climate for an Australian yeah. <laughs> in terms of the weather. Um, you know, still pretty cold there, but 
And of course, I was interested in doing some skiing and, you know, standard Australian stuff going over and, and you know, hiking, skiing, camping, things like that. So I really wanted to move to Vancouver just because Whistler's close by and, yeah. and there was a few companies out there doing medicinal cannabis. Um, how, I mean, how I actually uh, broke in was going to conferences. Yeah, like they have a famous conference there called Lyft, um, L-Y-F-T, and that's sort of a, a, a cannabis conference similar to MJ BizCon in the States where you have a variety of vendors and talks going on. And I just, yeah, sat, sat at every single talk for the two days and introduced myself to everybody, uh, you know, basically cold introductions. And uh, yeah, I just kind of made connections through that and learned who's who in the zoo. And yeah, eventually after probably maybe 50 resume uh, sends to local companies, I got a hit. Um, and, you know, just sort of touching on that briefly, going to uh, the University of Melbourne, the, one of the production managers at a company that I worked for called Tantalus Labs, he'd actually done a uh, exchange semester at Burnley University and he saw the resume and he went, wow, I know I've been there. I've, I've had that experience at that university and yeah, he was curious. So you never really know how, um, I mean, it's a great stroke of luck. Yeah. yeah. You've created your own luck because, you know, persistence pays. Um, you know, I guess Angus, you're living proof of, you know, if someone wants something bad enough, they get off their backside and make it happen. And, and kudos to you for doing that. And uh, the next question I want to ask when you, when you return to Australia, having that international experience on your CV, do you think that that accelerated your job opportunities here in Australia? Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of, um, there's definitely having that experience and that production experience in medicinal cannabis in Canada um, certainly gave me, um, I think, a leg up and it was sort of a self-paced experience and definitely was cut uh, cut in half by COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like, I, you know, I ended up leaving Van Vancouver in March. 2020, uh, packing up my apartment and selling my cars for, you know, $900 a piece and jumping on a flight. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So, I mean, it was it was a disruptive time moving back, but I certainly uh, sunk my teeth in and I was lucky enough to, to um, make some relationships at Kang Group here and, and, you know, they've been fantastic and it sort of culminated in this job out in Mildura. So, yeah, certainly, certainly very lucky to have... Um, so you're down there as a cultivation manager now and uh, we'll, we'll steer clear of where you work and what you do for, for privacy reasons. But as a cultivation manager, um, you know, what would be... And I've got to say, Angus, I'm, I'm really impressed and I think that any young guy that has a passion for, for agriculture, horticulture, you know, one of my biggest... Um, how do I put this? One of these concerns that I've often raised in my podcast is there's not enough people, young people coming into agriculture. And, you know, we're, we're importing a lot of expertise from your South Africa's, your Zimbabwe's, your, your Dutch, your Holland, um, you know, a lot of agronomists coming in from Mexico. In, and uh, we're bringing in a lot of these expertise when you're living proof that we actually don't have to do that. We've just got to find young kids with a little bit of ticker and passion, send them overseas, go to their education and bring them back. Um, going from Whistler to, to yeah, Vancouver to Mildura, um, that's a big change, mate. Uh, I've found living down in Mildura. I've got a lot of friends down in Mildura. It's actually a great place to live. As you know, Mildura is a perfect weather horticulture town. It's yeah. a sorry, city. Um, it's it's been really refreshing to be honest. It's such a nice place to live, and it's very relaxed. And Can Group as a company couldn't be more excited about um, being an employer in town here or in the in the region, and really like focusing on some of these high tech agriculture jobs as well. So you know we can sort of touch on the facility a little bit. It's in the Mildura region, and, and it's going to be sort of a 
a quite a large employer in the area. So we're definitely uh, looking to make as many, you know, friends, colleagues and, and step out and, and make great relationships in the area. Yeah. So with um, facility, being a, a big, great production area. It is, it's huge. But with a, with a facility growing and cultivating, you know, marijuana, cannabis, um, it's deemed as a drug in Australia. Obviously, you must have 10-foot fences so nobody jumps the fence. There must be a level of security in place that nobody comes into your, you know, your crop, your environment. How, how does that all work? I'm intrigued. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably have to pass you on to the regulatory department yeah. um, just to get permission to even talk mm -hmm. about some of the security uh, security aspects. But definitely, there are a bunch of really, really rigorous security checks in place that you have to go through to cultivate cannabis. And, you know, of course, we're, we're definitely very Boy Scout on that one. We're, you know, 100% committed to holding up um, the highest esteem for what we do um, in the cannabis or the medicinal cannabis space. You, you probably don't know the answer to this question, but um, and I might throw questions at you because I'm so bloody intrigued. Um, you know, yeah. as a, a lettuce grower, you grow your lettuce, okay? You take it to your pack shed, you box it up, you send it to the markets or Woolworths or Coles. Um, how do you find a market that takes your cannabis? Um, where does it go once you, you harvest it? Like, a, Obviously, it has to go to some therapeutic board, government-approved company. Um, you know, it's it's quite unique because you're growing a product that is so specialised. Um, you know, any tomato grower, or lettuce grower, or capsicum grower, you know, can send his product anywhere. But um, do you grow it on contract, or do you, you know, where does it go? How, how does all that work? Are you familiar with it, or are you more just focused on the growing? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely more focused on the growing, but as soon as um, basically the product is turned into, I mean, at Mildura here, we're still starting up, so we don't have, uh, we're sort of slated for 2022 production, um, but we go right from uh, propagation of plants right through to finished, uh, finished dose products. So that's the design of the facility. Um, in a nutshell, and it's sort of one of the um, bigger projects slated in Australian cannabis. So it's a huge undertaking. Um, but what it does offer us is uh, that control through the whole process. So you're growing in a, forms. In a um, controlled atmosphere, controlled temperature, because it gets bloody cold down in Mildura. Yeah. Sure. So this is, um, I mean, it's all, it's a Dutch, you know, basically Alps is the, the company that helped us design and project manage this this Dutch style glass house. So it's a Venlo style greenhouse. Yeah. Mate, tell me um, from your perspective with, with farming, um, when you went to uni and that was what, 10 years ago, eight years ago, did you ever think you'd be running a marijuana crop in Mildura? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's definitely, for me, it's definitely a dream job. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm still at uni, believe it or not, doing a Master's of Ag Sciences at Melbourne Fantastic. again. So <laughs> always learning. Um, it's just now I have to take, take all the management classes to really hone in that people management aspect and, and learn how to motivate people and work work with people that much better than sort of being, a, you know, an operator or a specialist technician. Um, so, yeah, that's been an interesting kind of next step for me. But, yeah, you know, definitely at, at uni, that, I mean, that's really what uni does, in my opinion. It sort of opens up your, your mind and your eyes to different industries and different things you can do. For sure. And, you know, had I not, had cannabis not been an option, I probably would be in controlled environment agriculture or research glass houses and things along those lines, breeding plants. And yeah, I'd definitely still be working in the same environments and, and doing the same thing with a different plant, I think. Yeah. Um, mate, what advice would you give to a young guy finishing uni? You? Like, you're a guy that I, talking to you today, I admire you greatly because you looked at what you wanted to do and then you got off your ass went to Canada, you made it happen. Um, you know, sitting down at conferences, 
cold calling, you know, all the big shots of the industry, just some young Aussie bloke walking in and saying, g'day, mate, my name's Angus. Um, that takes a lot of balls, I've got to tell you. It takes a lot of guts and credit to you. What advice would you give to a young bloke that wants to fast track his horticultural career? Um, would it be to do what you've done or uh, was it because your industry was something so specialised? Um, I think uh, just listening back on you there, you know, you, you put everything that we've discussed in sort of that career timeline in, in a nice bow, but there's never any nice bows. <laughs> so, you know, you say, you know, for example, moving to Canada and, and, you know, ingratiating myself with that industry and getting to know people, there was, you know, a good three months where I was flipping tacos and uh, being, you know, going to the ski fields uh, on the weekends and, you know, not really had any uh, opportunity in, in the industry of horticulture and just asking around, you know. So there are these periods in life when you do have those, uh, you know, bumps in the road or you're not necessarily happy and, and not looking at those bumps in the road or those setbacks as times when, you know, you're failing, but more just like this is telling you something. This is telling you you need to keep looking for what you want to look for. Realistically, so, yeah. how many letters, uh, how many people did you meet at this conference uh, as to how many letters or resumes did you send off before you got a hit? Must have been 50. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, sometimes you just get, um, you know, that auto automated hiring um, sort of message back and then sometimes you, you pique someone's interest. Um, you know, for a young person, I, I think relationships are really important as well, you know, like definitely don't overlook any of the, the uni uh, relationships you have and you know, some of my uni friends are still to this day, like some of my closest friends and contacts and um, again, that contact over in Canada where someone did a chance, uh, you know, exchange semester and suddenly we, we, we'd shared lecturers and we were 20 years um, apart in sort of study time. So it's kind of, it's crazy how I think these relationships go. and these tiny threads of, um, you know, meetings that can, you know, really change your life. So. You make a really good point and I'm, uh, I'm a lot older than you, buddy. Um, you know, I'm in my mid-40s. And I graduated from one of the most exclusive schools in Australia um, in 1995, a place called the King School um, yeah. in, in Sydney. And it's a well-renowned boarding school. And, you know, some 20 years on, um, the old school tie always comes in very handy. Um, you know, about two months ago, we were looking at ways of bringing in... Um, workers from overseas and uh, trying to work out how we're going to charter flights. And I got on LinkedIn and lo and behold, one of my mates I went to school with, Mac, um, he's a massive consultant in Hong Kong now of a massive aviation company. And I got on the phone to him and I'm like, hey mate, it's Rod, you know, like, uh, yeah, we, we finished school in 95 together. Yeah, you're talking 2020, that's shit, do the maths, you know, 26, 27 years ago. Oh. And, it, and it was like yesterday. And, uh, you know, maintaining and developing those relationships, I think is very important. Um, you know, you've got 50 knockbacks. How, how did it feel when you got that one person that pricked their ears, mate? It must have must have been all worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's brutal getting rejected. Anyone will tell you that. Um, you know, obviously people in other industries like, you know, entertainment, they get constant rejection. So, you know, I guess it's always one of those things where if you really want something, you're going to keep trying and, and don't let anyone sort of bump you off that path. Um, that's interesting. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask you, Rod, you know, bringing up that that labour force um, kind of issue is the peace rate thing that's happened in the last two days, and this is pretty topical. It is. Um, it is. I actually did a paper. I did a paper for, um, believe it or not, a management subject in the last couple of months that, you know, at the end you have to make recommendations, and some of my recommendations are, you know, actually strangely some things that the government. Uh, ended up doing with kind Look, of the, the visas. And I, in the last 12 to 18 months with the pandemic, Angus, if there wasn't peace rates, there wouldn't have been anybody on farms. 
Okay. Workers have been earning $40 and $50 an hour. I think the biggest issue with piece rates has not been the piece rate itself. It's been the worker on the piece rates. I mean, we, the government have sort of been forcing all these backpackers to go out to farms and do their 88 days. And these guys didn't want to be out there. You know, these, mm. these pommies and that come over for a gap year and to drink piss at Bondi Hotel. They didn't come to work on a strawberry farm, you know, in Caboolture. Um, you know, that, that's not what their dream was. So they were sitting there every day and they were just tick, 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 ticking their 88 days off. Well, they weren't making money and mm. um, they were jumping up and down saying we're being exploited. Look, I... I, I don't have an issue with piece rates, but I have a major issue with farmers that exploit piece rates for their own benefit. Okay, mm. I have a major issue with that. And I, one thing that's really upset me throughout this whole piece rate debate was seeing the unions demonize um, the horticultural sector as these exploiters of labor, which is simply not the case. I'll tell you something now, 99.5, percent of farmers do the right thing. That 0.5 that don't, I wish the unions would, would have turned around and said, didn't, I wish the unions, how do I put this? I wish the unions came out and said, this worker earned $6 on Jack's farm at this address, don't go there. And name and shame the farm doing the wrong thing because there's no room for those sort of people in our industry. And unfortunately, everyone's been tarred with the same brush. This piece rate debate, I've had growers on the phone all night last night and <laughs> I understand it from a grower's perspective. A grower doesn't want to pay an hourly rate to a backpacker that is non-productive and doesn't want to be there. Um, mm. In saying that, we probably shouldn't force backpackers to go out and do something that they don't want to do because then they're going to be non-productive. So it's double-edged sword. I think we're going through a massive structural change with regards to the whole horticultural sector, COVID's brought in some major changes. And you know, I think in the, the Ausbeds report, there was 26,000 people that weren't going to be um, working on farms in 2021. Yeah, 20, 20, 20, yeah 26,000. 26, that's, that's, that's what they know about. Okay, I can tell you something now. It's closer to 40 and 50,000. Farmers at the moment, like my phone does not stop with farmers ringing for help and you know it's tough i think we need to accelerate the ag visa uh, but i also think that you know farmers the farmers that jumped up and down yesterday about you know having to pay an hourly rate as a ceiling probably need to start looking at why those workers that were earning 10 and 12 bucks an hour why were they earning it um, was it because they had no desire like i can I run a large labour hire company as well. I can train people, but I can't train laziness. If someone's lazy, they're lazy. I can't, you know, I see it on strawberry farms all the time. We get, you know, a lot of people from Hong Kong come out and do their 88 days. But you're pushing shit uphill to try and find a tree in Hong Kong. It's a concrete jungle. And you know, you're putting them out on a farm and they don't want to be there. You know, they want to be in the cities. They, you know, they want to be... Yeah, in Melbourne because that's where they all want to be. Um, why are we forcing them to go on farms? We need to get this ag visa accelerated and get professional fruit pickers in that actually want to be on farm. And I think that's what's going to change. Um, I think the whole industry's mindset needs to change. I don't think it's a bad thing that we've put a ceiling on peace rates. I'll be honest with you. I, and I, grow I think it's great. Grow yeah, I think it's great. Because... I've always said, I believe in an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. But the farmers are saying, well, we're not getting an honest day's work out of these guys that are bludgy. Well, we need to find people that we can get an honest day's work out of. So, you know, then getting paid $10 isn't the answer. Getting the right employees that want to be out on farm, um, I think is. And I think once that happens, um, you know, these days of paying, you know, Ten dollars for someone will be over. I think that's disgusting. I don't think anybody should be out there busting their backside and earning ten dollars an hour. So, 
Um, yeah. me, and, you know, now being in the regions, you know, being in Mildura, yeah. um, the, some, of the, some of the great work, um, I think it's the University of Sydney, there's an economics professor there who's written on the regions and that, you know, the ability to grow. Um, and, you know, through migrant labour is how we're going to grow the regions. There are people in the city that just don't want to work in they don't want to do the work, rural yeah. areas and yeah. having people come from the Pacific and having people come from um, Southeast Asia and Asia and having a path to residency and putting it's in that time in the regions yeah. for specialists is definitely how I think, yeah, I, I think we solve that. I think so too. And I, I think it's great for regional migration to bring out, I think it's great what the government's done to give the ag visa that hook that after three years you've got to park the residency because um, it's going to build regional migration, it's going to build regional cities. I see it in a lot of areas that uh, I work in at the moment where, you know, there's a couple of big meat works that have got big Filipino communities or, um, you know, big Thai communities. Uh, those guys aren't moving to the city, they love the regional area and it's affordable for them. They can set definitive routes down in that area and because most of the farmers I talk to, and I'm on farm seven days a week around Australia, uh, any farm that I go to and I see the average, you know, 65 to 70 year old farmer that's worked his backside off day in, day out for 30 years, first thing I ask him is where's his kids? And you know what 90% of them say? Oh, I've got a daughter in Adelaide or I've got a daughter, son in Melbourne. He's working in a law firm. Yeah, you know, he's, she's working in an accountant's office. Um, that's why I was so excited to talk to you as a young bloke coming through the ranks. You're a rare breed, mate. You're a really rare breed. And what we do need is we need a lot more Angus Murrays for the next generation. But we're not going to get them in Australia. Let's be realistic. We're not going to get them in Australia. You know, you, I've done a lot of work throughout Watsonville, California, um, Salinas Valley, uh, talking to a lot of, you know, there's, there's Mexican agronomists over there that, you know, would cut their right arm off to come and, and start <laughs> a life in Australia and would bring so many skills and so many values uh, and would be a real asset to any regional and remote community. and. And I think that's what we need to do. We're, we've got to forget about these backpackers and the 88-day visa. Let them all go and wait tables in the city and surf at the Gold Coast, because that's what they want to do. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. And, and if we bring them out onto farms, if we keep pushing those guys out onto farms, I mean, I, I've seen it firsthand. I've, I've walked into a strawberry field where I've been managing people, and I've seen a backpacker sitting there on his phone, you know, getting his playlist ready, and... He's turned around, I've said to him, mate, put your phone away, you've got to, I'll give you a tip, you're on peace rate, you've got to actually pick in order to make money. You know, you can't be sitting there on your phone and your iPod. And they look you straight in the eye and they say, I don't care, I'm just here to do my days. I'm just here to do my visa days, I don't give a shit. And I can understand why farmers are jumping up and down because no farmer where the, the margins are so fine as it is, wants to be wasting money paying an unproductive worker. And I'm gonna go one further here and I'm gonna tell you the biggest problem in our industry and what needs to be addressed is the supermarkets have got to stop screwing the farmers on what they're paying them for their produce so the farmers don't have to screw the workers. It's so not so eventually, yeah, that's it's what not we're eventually going to end up because with this minimum minimum wage that pickers get now, what do you think that's going to do to food prices? Well, I think that you know, as a farmer, you know, a supermarket, and, and I'm not I'm not signalling out any supermarket here because I think they're all the same. Whether it be you know Woolworths, Coles, Costco, Aldi, they're all the same. They're all chasing the GP for their shareholders, and that's all they give a shit about. They don't care less about the grower. So if the farmer, if the supermarket goes to the grower and says, right, we want you to grow 100 tonnes of grapes for us, okay, we're going to sign a contract for you to supply us 100 tonne of grapes, then what needs to happen now is the farmer needs to say, okay, not a problem. We'll take that mandate to, to grow that 100 tonne of grapes for you. However, that 100 tonne of grapes is costing me $4.50 a kilo 
to produce. So I need a minimum price of five dollars. That's what right. needs to happen. Now mm -hmm. the supermarkets won't do that, okay? Because you know they're not going to give you you know a minimum price. Well, they're going to have to because the farmer now has a minimum price he has to pay for the for his workforce. So he's got some of the yeah. I mean, some of the discussions that have been had in the grain industry, just doing a lot of ag work at the moment um, through the university. It's kind of interesting that they're talking about soil mining and mining nitrogen and how do you build that nitrogen mining cost into grain production and eventually we're going to start looking at some of these things you know we're mining soil carbon we're mining nitrogen how do we start building in that cost as i mean you know not in my industry but in the broader ag industry how are we going to build that in and have some of these discussions with people who are um, you know, frankly, quite powerful chains that they need to start being more flexible environmentally with some well, of the farmers to well, build. Well, they do. You know, I, I always use the analogy of the dollar a litre milk. You know, they the, the chain single-handedly wiped out every small independent dairy farmer. You know, and it was a race to the bottom. Sure. If, if we're not careful with produce, it's going to be the same. So the, the, the growers need to stand up to the chains a little bit more um and say to them hey because i guarantee you that bloke that the chain say to him hey i want you to grow 100 tons of grapes if he says i want a minimum price of five dollars they're going to come back to him and say that's okay just go 50 tons so i think what needs to happen too is growers have got to grow less and be more profitable too the margins have been so small that they've grown more and more and more to try and get that turnover turnover mm -hmm. turnover it's not the answer the answer is to be profitable, to know what your costs are. Uh, I mean, you're working in a, a cutting edge business at the moment that I can almost guarantee without knowing anything about your business, your investors would know exactly what it costs to harvest and cultivate a plant. Sure, and we measure just about everything we can, you know. So it's sort of one of these conversations that we were having, I think in the back and forth prior to this talk was, how do producers who may not be that 100 tonnes a year grower, how do they enter markets? Um, you know, because obviously the supermarket chains might be avoiding them, but there is a market for high quality produce. And how, how do you become a farmer that is also marketing your produce? Without question, Local there farms, is, you know, deliveries, yeah, all that. I, I, see it in, I see it in strawberries, and I do a lot of work in the strawberry industry up here in Queensland. and. There's, there's a little strawberry grower up here and they're good friends of mine, Dieter and Sue, and they grow 60,000 plants where the average strawberry grower grows 400,000 or a million or two million. So they're a tiny, tiny farm. Mm. But Dieter, I call him a mad scientist because he's, he's German and he tinkers with all these things to try and you know get that little competitive edge he grows the best product and it's and i'll tell you straight it's too good for the chain stores um so he's got a definitive market where he's pre-selling all that stock to a top-end fruit shop because he's only a small operator there is a role for the small operator if you're going to do if you're going to have a point of difference because a small operator will always be able to grow better than a broad acre mass production you know and you know, I see the large packing sheds in our industry that have 200 packers in their shed. And then I go to Dita's shed where there's four packers and his wife Sue is making sure every strawberry is packed, you know, perfectly. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's a market for the small grower. What scares me the most is it's not a level playing field with surety of labor with the small grower right now. And that's something I've been advocating a lot for. I think there's, you know, there's a big market for the small grower, you know, the Aussie battler um, that that works. I was at a farm in Stanthorpe on the weekend. I went and saw a mate of mine, Mario, because he's got a little farm and he grows the most amazing broad beans and we're Italian and my father mm. loves his broad beans. So, I mean, the pasta. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So when I told my father that, you know, one of our growers was growing broad beans, he was like, make sure you get me some. So. You know, I went and saw Mario and bought a couple of boxes of broad beans off him and he had his kids out there weeding, you know, after school. 
Um, that's a great Aussie family success story. They should have the same opportunities that the large corporate companies do. But, you know, when we talk about surety of labour and bringing in workers under the, the seasonal worker program or the Pacific Labour Scheme, these small guys like Sue and Dita, like Mario, they're too small to get approved for those big programs. So I think there's a role for the small farmer, but I think there needs to be more of a level playing field where the little bloke can access labour as well. If he doesn't access labour, then he's going to end up shutting the doors because, you know, all the big farmers that are moving in are offering 150 to 200 grand a year for farm managers. And, you know, he'll just shut his farm and go work as a farm manager. And I think that's really sad because we're going to miss out on real quality grown produce that's grown for flavor rather than grown for volume because they are a little small farm. And a lot of these smaller growers, they do grow for flavor because they've got to have that competitive edge where a lot of the large growers, they're growing for volume because, you know, they, they need to pump volume in order to make money. So I think there's a big role for small growers. I just wish it was more of a level playing field. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so many things to touch on there. You know, if you're going for yield, the flavour goes from plants. You know, we know that with a variety of plants. We know that work's been done um, at various places throughout the world. And, you know, of course, these small farmers really need to be kind of uh, valued in society and touching back to young people in agriculture these young entrepreneurial positions and spots or small holdings that potentially these people could be getting into, unfortunately are being gobbled up a little bit. And I think that's part of the problem. Say as a young agriculturist, if I'm looking at buying, you know, five hectares of grapes out in Mildura here, um, it's basically gonna be a craft situation, right? Like it's gonna be a small scale and, and you really can't compete with a large grape grower out here. So we really need to value that small scale um, entrepreneurship on farms as we do say in building apps in the city. 100% and I guarantee you one thing, we talk about the next generation of farmers. If I had a son and my son came to me at 18 years of age and said, I want to get involved in the strawberry industry. I would send him to Dita that has 50,000 plants before I'd send him to the farm that has 3 million plants. Because I'll tell you now, I know for a fact that that small farm will give him the time, will give him the knowledge, will teach him everything that university doesn't teach him and that's how to run on a shoestring budget because that's the most smaller farms. Yeah. You know, I've seen some of these small farms um, and, you know, the kids that work on those farms, the younger guys that have gone off and gone into apprenticeships of, um, you know, mechanics or what have you. And they learned so much on the farm because they had to, because if something was broke, they had to find a way to fix it. Um, in, a, yeah. in a large corporate organisation, something breaks, I will put it over there yeah. and we'll just put it away yeah. because it's a corporate company. So I think one of the biggest things for the younger generation is we need those, those smaller and medium-sized farms that will give them time. Um, you know, I learned more about farming from... There's a guy that I spent four years working for, a guy called Ray Daniels, and uh, he taught me more about farming than anything. And every morning, we used to put a knapsack, actually, I gotta lie, he used to put a knapsack on, I used to walk next to him, and he'd be walking his crops because we were knapsacking in between the rows, you know, weed spraying, but he would talk to me about a crop and what we were looking at and, you know, predictions and what they needed as far as, you know, manipulating FERT programs or what have you, um, you wouldn't get that on a big corporate farm. Yeah, and, uh, and diversity of crops as well. You know, people oh, love question. diversity of crops and, and these smaller scale farms allow people to try points of difference, I guess, if you will. You know, different crops, different types of, of you know, say strawberry X or, you know, berry Y. Yeah. And this is this is a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. So that's, look, that's my take on you know, the whole peace yeah. rate debate and the role <laughs> of the smaller farmer. I think that um, 
we've got to be doing more to look after those little growers. I think, the, and more importantly, most importantly, it's the Aussie way. We, you know, the Aussie way, the Aussie battler. You know, the guy out there busted his backside from daylight till dawn. Why are we shitting on them? We should be, you know, when someone's down and out, you know, you don't kick them, you give them a drink. And a lot of these smaller growers at the moment, they can't compete with the bigger farms and the bigger checkbooks. Um, we've got to find a way which we can help them because in the grand scheme of things, I've seen over the last five years, a lot of big farms topple, okay? I've seen a lot of big farms go into receivership or go into, you know, administration. Um, I haven't seen a lot of small ones because they just keep ticking away like Thomas the Tank Engine. They just keep ticking away, ticking away. And they're often ignored. We need to, to help them a little bit more. Mate, I'm going to thank you for your time and I'm going <laughs> to congratulate yeah. you on... On your success, um, it's a it's a unique industry that you're in, and it's an industry that that's growing rapidly. Um, it seems to be. I think I, when I was at Port Connections this year, um, you know, I think I met four or five people in um, the cultivation of cannabis industry, which you know, the year before I'd met nobody. So, yeah. and I reckon next year I'll probably meet 44. Um, it's, a, it's an industry growing that big. Mate, I want to congratulate you on actually going out and accomplishing and doing what you did by going overseas, finding, you know, getting 50 knockbacks. You had a relentless persistence <laughs> approach and, you know, two years down the track or three years down the track, you're here, you know, managing, you know, being a cultivation manager in an industry that you love, um, mate, you're a success story. I think, I wish there was a lot more guys. How, how old are they, Angus, if you don't mind me saying? What, you'd be in your 30s? Uh, I'm 32. Yeah, so yeah. You're, you're still a young bloke. Um, and, you know, Not you've so done, young anymore. You've done so much. Um, and I think you need to be commended. Um, I think the, the industry needs a lot more guys like you mate keep in touch um we hope that your your new company down there that you're involved with um are doing great things down in mildura which we hear um yeah. investing a lot of money into a regional area and that that to me is a fantastic thing whenever i see a big company this is this is going to be one of the greatest water cultural projects in recent memory in Australia. And, you know, being in a regional area, to your point, really makes Can happy that we can help contribute and help grow a local regional well, place. I think every, great everyone's best. You know, last week I was down in Stanthorpe and I, um, Stanthorpe's an area about three hours from Brisbane, big um, fruit growing area. Um, and I was talking to the, the local MP, James Lister, and we were talking about how this last year with the shortage of labour, the farmers just didn't suffer. The, the RSL suffered because no one went there for a stake. You know, the, the IGA suffered because the people were just not around. Three takeaways in town shut down because they all suffered because um, of the lack of people. When a company like yours chooses an area like um, Mildura, it's a shot in the arm for Mildura that, hey, this is a town that we want to invest in. But more so, all the small businesses in Mildura are only going to benefit as, as more traffic comes into town due to the, uh, the size of your company. So that's, that's only yeah. a great thing. We need more regional investment. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Australia and learnings from Canada, there is a lot more regional cities, you know, there really just are those 100, 200,000 cities in Canada that people do move to for one job or another. So I think creating more sort of mobile Australians is always a good thing, you know, hey, I'm moving to Mildura for a professional job, should be an option for people if they want to, not just this Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide sort of what I get, and you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a, a young guy working for me, which um, I wanted to promote, and I wanted to make him the regional manager of Stanthorpe. And I said, I want you to go down there and own that region, okay? I, I said, you know, you've got a wife and a young kid. You can buy a house down there for 250 grand. 
on a thousand square meter block right in town. There's everything you need in Stanthorpe. It's a, a mini version of Mildura, but it's a, a quaint little town. I said, mate, you're trying to buy a house in, in Brisbane for 600. You're going to be earning the same money, but your cost of living is going to be a quarter. It's a no brainer. I couldn't get him to, to want to relocate. Um, you know, for me, if, if I was in his position, I would have said, mate, you know, when can I start? Um, so changing the perception of, of regional living, I think is also a big thing because, you know, for me, the cost of living, whether it be Melbourne, Sydney, even here in Brisbane now, is just escalating out of control. If you've got a good stable job on a good income, you can live a pretty good life in a regional area. Yeah, and you know, indeed, if you're a, a professional in the city now with the internet and the telecommunications that we all have, that just makes it easier. So yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely a fan of that approach, especially with you know technology nowadays, Rod. No, I think so. Well, mate, I'm going to wrap this up, but I want to thank you for your time and yeah. thanks for having a yarn with us. Is there uh, any more questions you had about cannabis? Now's your chance. Mate, you know, you know something? Cannabis is something that I know nothing about. Like yep. I said, um, it, it intrigues me because a lot of a lot of mm. growers, especially in protective cropping at the moment, are looking at alternative crops because a lot of protective cropping, whether it be a raspberry or a blueberry or you know, is so labor intensive that they're actually looking for something especially now with this peace trade <laughs> that's happened today you might start finding a lot of people that have got protective cropping wanting to grow marijuana the legal way so <laughs> mate, tell, them, uh, tell them to send me their resumes <laughs> mate i want to thank you for having a yarn with us angus uh, appreciate your time best of luck down there in mildura and um mate i've got a lot of friends down there it's a great town it's a great environment and uh Mate, if I can ever do anything to, to help you down there, don't uh, don't hesitate to give me a shout out. Yeah, if you're ever down here, definitely uh, look me up. We'll go out and uh, chat more horticulture, Rod. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Good on you, buddy. Take care.